Welcome to a narrative of a love, a series of conversations with thinkers, leaders, and spiritual teachers about their understanding of love and how they see the significance of love in our personal and political lives. I'm Shito Gyo, and I'm your host for these conversations. Today, a very special guest is joining us, Steve Kilalea, who is a philanthropist focusing on peace and sustainable development with an extensive background in international businesses. He established the Global Peace Index, the world's leading measure of global peacefulness, and the independent think tank, the Institute for Economics and Peace. He also founded and sponsored one of the largest private overseas aid organizations based in Australia. Welcome, Steve. It's so wonderful to have you on this program. You are an international entrepreneur, founder of an, an award-winning global think tank with expertise in technology, investment, business, active in philanthropy. The list goes on. So with such an intriguing background, where would you like to start? To start with maybe one of the different types of love. So started off thinking about this session, I started to think, well, what is a definition of love? But I couldn't really clearly form one definition of love because it all depended on the lens from which you were looking at it from. So there's personal love, there's impersonal love, there's the spiritual love, uh, there's love of nature. We even love our pets, don't we? You can also sort of look at love in other directions too. Some people love their country. And that's a group identity thing. We can love the group identity which we've got. Most people, when I speak to about love, but when you say, what, what, tell me about love in your life, they'll talk about their intimate partner or spouse, or they'll talk about their kids. And I think for most people, that's the area where most people really sort of feel the, uh, the most love, I guess, yeah, and that's where they identify and attach the most. Uh, we can also kill people we love. So love in many ways is just the, it, it can be this the combination of different emotions. Love also, for many people, is conditional. It's uh, dependent on uh, what, they, what, what they actually get out of the relationship. Oh, then there's sort of the uh, plutonic love, okay, there's different forms of love like that. There's also love, uh, which is just unconditional, love which just gives. There's also, let's say, the love of caring for the sick or the elderly, other forms of love like that. For Confucius, the uh, love was duty. Uh, it's not something many people in the uh, West would perceive these days, but even still in China, uh, the concept of duty springing out of Confucianism is still very, very strong. It's through your duty to, uh, that you show your love. Uh, and so, look, I think they're just uh, some of the different uh, forms of the uh, love, which I can think of just uh, quickly offhand. So I'll let you take it from there. There's, a, there's an awful lot there to start with, I think. Well, it's interesting. Well, thank you for this wonderful sketch of um, a very complex landscape of love. I think it also demonstrates a difficulty we always confront it, and that is when we try to define something or trying to discern what it is or what is not, we can end up with lots of categories like you just showed, but unsure of which one to support, nor how we may act. So how do we love? So imagine if we treat love as a verb, it becomes a way of being, a way of acting. Okay. Now, for yourself, how has your own understanding of love been elaborated in your, in your life and your work? So I think so. the first thing for me with love, uh, just before hitting that, uh, is I think well, if I look at my peace studies, one of the things we came to with that is the definition for peace 
dependent on how what sort of piece you were looking at and what you wanted to do with it. So if you're looking at, let's say, inner piece, personal piece, the definition of that's very, very different than you're looking at a society and the peacefulness of a society. Sort of the higher levels of love and the ones which we tend to talk and more aspire about tend to be more in the concept of sort of the, if you like it, the uh, impersonal love. Uh, it's not actually sort of necessarily directed at one individual or small group of individuals. Also, it tends to have a spiritual element to it as well, sort of transcendental element, if you like. Uh, uh, and it's also something which is caring. And it's a lot like peace. A lot of people get confused with peace as being something uh, uh, passive. It's uh, Peace is vibrant. Peace is active. Uh, and in a peace, it's a, it particularly that as you lose your afflictive emotions, what comes with that is you've actually now got the ability to be able to be more active because you've not got energy going into negative things. So we start to look at that spiritual dimension and that development there. Well, I can see that the peace, inner peace, in many ways, in love, get start to come together. And again, if we come back to that concept of as we lose our negative and afflictive emotions, we actually have more energy and more capacity. And as we lose them, also what's left, as we could say, is this sense of love. It's an innate emotion in the background of the universe that may sound a little bit strange, but to, uh, that's sort of the way I start to see it now because we come back and we look at look at this through, I guess, the Eastern philosophical view. So we start to lose the afflictive emotion. What gets left is just this state, and what's it's called? And it's it, it lacks a uh, thought. It's non-dual, and so it's just this background state inside us. And that that state is just a pure, relaxed state. But it's what you could call love. Uh, the great, uh, yeah, 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 great uh, philosopher Rumi, for example, he once described the uh, we're all vessels of love moving inside an ocean of love. And that sort of in many ways expresses a lot of the feelings which you get out of Hinduism, you also get it out of Buddhism, that we're just, uh, in many ways, we're just this part of this one whole, this one whole, when you're part of it, it's love. And so we can see that expressed through all the major different religions in different ways. But ordinary people like myself just get the slightest glance of that. So, uh, uh, but it's enough to think that the concepts are real. I just, this is beautiful from, from the, maybe you, you could use uh, the Greek word, the er eros to describe the beginning of your experience, but then you move on to some kind of heartfulness and uh, in, then you come to this kind of, a, it, what you call it, the in, almost like the innate energizing force of the universe as a love, as very beautiful and that non-dualistic non way of seeing uh, self other and the world and everything. But then you also said the love is actually it's, it's like inner peace is vibrant. It's vibrant because it's um, dynamic, the move, um, dynamic movement. And so could you give us um, an illustration in terms of um, peacefulness in the world? How does that kind of, um, it, often we say inner peace is a, is a state of tranquility, almost like stillness. How does the stillness at the same time um, 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 be experienced as, as a vibrant way of being in the world? These people, their actions, you can see through their actions, their dedication to something other than themselves. And that's that impersonal love. It's a, it's a, it's a high, I guess it's a higher level of love than what a lot of us uh, feel. feel. It's a, uh, uh, yeah. So I guess to some extent, and that doesn't, really answer your question doesn't really answer your question uh but myself i just yeah, i don't actually question my motivation i just sort of follow what i feel like doing hmm. um i read in your book um that you really had very extraordinary life journeys and it's these life journeys that actually allowed you 
um, to develop very unique or innovative conception of peace. Could you just talk a little bit about your life journeys? Maybe for you, it's not extraordinary, but for a lot of others, um, they, they are quite extraordinary. And especially the moments that when you arrived at um, 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 a, 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 a question, you say, about peacefulness in the world. So how that moment of revelation led you to develop an innovative conceptions of peace? And I'm just going to put all these questions on the table so that you can choose which to answer. <laughs> and what's so new about this notion of peace? And how does this conception of peace differ sure. from the conventional ones? Sure, okay, look, I'll, I'll talk for a few minutes and any part of it you wanna go into more detail or unpack, more than happy to, Shiota. Uh, so look, I started off as born in uh, Sydney, Australia. I uh, had middle class parents, a, a very, a, in many ways, very, very conservative. My father went and worked for the public service. Uh, I was a product of the, of the Depression, a, a Second World War, as was my mother. And for them, security was incredibly non risk, non risk taking and security was incredibly important. So. My father had a, ended up with a job in the public service. So he ended up at quite senior levels. He was an engineer, electrical engineer. So I left school at a reasonable, reasonably young age, actually. I was out of school at 16. And that was mainly because I wanted to explore the world, and uh, particularly surfing. I loved surfing. I spent most of my life surfing and really only stopped about five years ago. Uh, uh, so that took me off to a lot of different places around the world. I was sort of in Indonesia surfing there when almost no one was going there. So there was great invention. I was living on sort of a dollar a day and I was living to do that. I was spending 20 cents on three meals and surfing and uh, being young, like you, you eat a lot. Uh, and sporting 40 cents for a room for the night. So I was living in the, uh, 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 in, in, in the family houses with Indonesians to do that. So I got a very, very good feel for uh, uh, what their life was like. And sort of the number of them, many, many, and also different cultures because we're moving into different cultures. So if you so to support the surfing, I set up a little import business back to Australia. Wasn't particularly good at it, but it's enough to finance my surfing. So, was things like filigree silver, uh, puka shell necklaces, the uh, batiks, things like that. And sort of these cultural differences were amazing. So if I go and buy, an, a, 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 for them, an expensive a, a hand-carved chess set, which some craftsman had spent a, a month, maybe two months a, a, a carving, we'd expect to go through a negotiation process. We both know the price. But you showed your respect by spending two hours negotiating with a couple of cups of tea over the chess set. Everyone knew where the price was going to be, but that was your way of showing respect. So for a business guy, we're used to sort of scalability. The more we can buy, the faster we can buy, then the quicker we can get on with our business, the more our business, but worked differently. Worked differently. Also, sort of purchasing puka shell necklaces. I remember going to this place where they've been discovered and sort of a, a, a going, okay, I'm going to buy a thousand because I knew there were knew there were a heap up there. So I turned up and I thought, okay, well, I'll buy the first one, just test the price out. Got that and went for three, then went for five from the same guy. And each time I asked him, the price went up. So at that stage, and like Indonesia is very different now, but at that stage, the more you wanted, the more desperate you were, therefore the more you should pay. Totally different now concepts, concepts here. And so anyway, sort of did that for a number of years. And then sort of when I was about 25, I thought, well, I've got to do something more substantial with my life, I guess. And so at that stage, I got into computing. But at that stage, I thought, well, what really put a lot of time into thinking about this? What should I do with my life? And I came down to three things. And sort of one was to take people on adventure trips in different parts of the world. So they'd be tracking through the Himalayas, whitewater rafting down the, uh, yeah, the Zambezi in, the, in uh, yeah, yeah, Zimbabwe, or something like that, 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 kind of, that, kind, that kind of adventure. It's a loved adventure. But what I thought was, well, 35, wouldn't be able to do that anymore. But in hindsight, it probably would have created a business out of it and just would have gone. The second thing was to uh, 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 do something uh, uh, in terms of helping people. Uh, and uh, yeah, so 
sort of he was thinking about being a social worker or something like that, but I didn't figure I'd earn enough money from that to sort of uh, uh, really be comfortable. And then the third thing was computing. It was just totally intuitive. At that stage, look, you couldn't get a computer under $5 million. So I couldn't even, getting access to computers was tough. So I went along, did an aptitude test uh, with a computer company and had an incredibly high aptitude. And so then sort of I did a, a course, a, a, they sponsored me to do a course over a few years and got into computing. And from there, sort of I had some ideas, created two a, a, a computer programs. Uh, on the back of both of them established a, a, a global technology company. The first one eventually ended up listed on NASDAQ, second on the Australian Stock Exchange. And so I made a lot of money out of that. And from there, then I established a family foundation which worked with the poorest of the poor. So we've uh, probably done about, uh, I think it's about 220 projects now. Average project runs for three years and average expenditure is about 100,000 uh, US dollars per annum per project. And so the direct beneficiaries out of that now, depending on how you count it, uh, and these aren't marketing numbers, they're, they're, they're pretty reasonable numbers. It'd be about 3.8 million people whose lives were substantially impacted. And so the aim with that was to work with the poorest of the poor. So that took me to a lot of war zones, near post war zones. And I was in Northeast Kivu in the Congo, which is one of the more violent places in the world. And I was walking through there and I suddenly started to think, what is the opposite of all these stressed out countries I'm spending time in? What are the most peaceful nations? Was there anything I could learn uh, uh, from them which we could bring into the projects we're doing? And it's just one of those fantasy questions. You know, we just get these fantasy questions just jumbling around through our mind all the time. So it was one of those kind of things. So I got back, did a search on the internet, couldn't find a thing. And that's how the Global Peace Index was born. But to that poses a really fundamental question. Is if a simple businessman like myself can be walking through Africa and wonder what are the most peaceful nations in the world and it hasn't been done, then how much do we actually know about peace? If you can't measure something, can you truly understand it? If you can't measure it, then how do you even know if your actions are helping you or hindering you in achieving your goals? You don't. And then what I realised, and this was, this was quite profound, uh, was that most of the time when we think we're studying peace, we're actually studying conflict. And peace and conflict aren't really the same concepts. They're sort of flip side maybe of the same coin. And they're interrelated, but they're not actually the same. The best I can do is use an analogy, I guess, with health for people. Through studying healthy people like right diet, a good mental disposition, regular exercise. You're going to learn none of those things through studying uh, your people who are on their deathbed. The study of healthy people will lead you there. And that's pretty much the same with peace. It's the study of healthy societies will teach us the fundamentals which keep a society healthy. And when a society is healthy, it has the resilience. So that when it gets hit with shocks, it won't actually fall into violence or worse still implode. And so I I think it's, so that was, so that for me was quite profound. And from that came concepts of positive peace and such. But in my book, Peace in the Age of Chaos, which you can see, Shira, you've got behind you next to those lovely flowers, uh, 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 it sort of sets out that journey. It's got a lot of stories, I guess, about uh, experiences in the developing world, uh, and the ones which really shaped me. Some of them have been quite profound. Some have been very uplifting. Others have been horrific. It's also got the story of an, a, 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 an entrepreneurial experience in how do we go about establishing a think tank. And then obviously it's, it's got the work which comes out of the Institute for Economics and Peace, and particularly sort of how do you measure peace, but more importantly, positive peace. In other words, that's what do you have to do to create a society which is a, a resilient and peaceful and prosperous. So tell me a bit more about this positive peace as a framework and as I asked you early what's so new about it and how does it differ from the conventional ones I mean this may sound like an obvious question because the conventional definition of peace is the absence of violence or war right so I guess 
And what happened is we've started out, we've developed the Global Peace Index, and that was the first, that's, that's the world's leading measure of global peace. And it's really the first time it had actually been done where you took the, the uh, most of the nations of the world, but you can't do all of them. But the index has got enough to cover 99.7% of the world's population. So you put that together, you've now got measurements of peace, so you can now rank them and such. So now what that allows you to do is statistical analysis. So what we've done then is we've got uh, you know, down here in Sydney, we've got about, depending on how you want to count, 25 to about 50,000 different uh, you know, data sets. And so taking a core group of them, and now what we've done is a mathematical modelling, statistical analysis to determine what are the factors most closely associated with highly peaceful societies. And that we call positive peace. We used other statistical techniques then now to clump these different things and it came in, out into an eight piece topology. And that topology we call the pillars of positive peace. And with eight of them, it's something most people can understand. <clears throat> but it's also not, a, it's a, how can I put it? It's not counterintuitive. Most people can see these eight pillars and they can relate to them. When we look at them, it really does give the ability to be able to cover cover, cover a, just about all aspects of society. So let's look at some of these pillars of positive peace. They're things like well-functioning government, a, 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 a strong business environment, high levels of human capital, free flow of information, which can be a free press, uh, acceptance of the rights of others and equitable distribution of resources. That doesn't mean equal, but it means the social contract, which people buy in so that they think things are equitable. Uh, you know, low levels of corruption would be another one, good relationships with neighbours. And so they all come together. So let's just unpack it and think about three. Okay, let's think about low levels of corruption, well-functioning government and free flow of information. So if we look at that in a societal sense, does Government, uh, yeah, well, does the functioning of government affect the levels of corruption? Does the functioning of government affect the free flow of information, or say the, the, the free press? But does the press also affect the way government operates? And does the press affect the way corruption operates? Or does corruption affect the way the press operates? And does corruption affect government? You can't pull it apart. You can't pull it apart. And that's just three without making it getting, uh, getting even more complex. And so it's these systemic effects that you know, you know, societies move as systems. Let's just take it something a bit more practical. So the idea of um, system thinking, and especially when you use system thinking to capture the, 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 the interconnectedness of that eight pillars of a positive piece, is very attractive. Now, can you provide an illustration of this, um, how these different pillars together serve as this in, in integral whole. Um, in identifying um, a case or an illustration, would you also be able to place the values of love we talk about in 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 this way of in in this way of uh, perceiving? Peace as a positive. We're looking at the positive piece, and like now, we can take that and put it into an index. So that now gives the ability about to see the direction countries are moving in. Are they moving in these virtuous cycles? Are they moving in vicious cycles? Because systems are moving, are, are interact together. So if we look at it, once a system is on a path, and this you can see, let's say, with the Europe and then the move the movement through Europe to the European Union, and it's somewhat reversing now. Uh, but you can see that you've got this virtuous cycle going on where sort of improvements in one area support improvements in another area, and it sort of interacts and interlaces together. So societies are moving in these virtuous cycles or in negative cycles where it's, things are getting, uh, uh, the system's winding down, it's getting more chaotic as it goes, and we call that a vicious cycle. Mm. So if we're looking at positive peace, there's this concept in it called attitudes. We can see positive peace made up of attitude, institutions and structures, if you like. But from the attitude side, we can see a, a, in a many parts of the world, particularly Western democracies, it's, they're, they're on the decline. 
So these are things which are statistically associated with peace on, 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 the, uh, on the negative side. So what we can see there is things like misinformation on, on the rise. Overall, the internet's been, been, been a good thing, but misinformation's on the rise. Perceptions of corruption within society are increasing, particularly the relationships between business and government. You can also see fractionalised elites. That's where the elites within a society start fighting more together and they've got less common ground. You could see that expressed, let's say, through Brit Exit. You could see it expressed with the, between the uh, yeah, Republicans and Democrats down in the US, but you can see that reflected in many other places as well. Equitable distribution of resources, uh, that seems to be dropping. A lot of the working conditions uh, are being eroded. And as we can see also sort of in many places, the uh, yeah, wages are also eroding, the rise of the gig economy. And the dynamics going on now, they're probably only going to increase those things. So we can, we're at a point now where we wouldn't say we're in sharp decline, but there is certainly a reversal in many aspects of those things which have uh, underpinned the progress of the uh, Western society in the last 50 years. Yeah. Um, could I ask you something about um, economy since we talk about it? So clearly when we perceive peace from a purely economic perspective, and that is peace depending on the economic growth, we can see that it would prioritise a capitalist a capitalist approach to seeking wealth. And when this happens, people can be instrumentalized to drive the economic engine, or they can be alienated from their work and well being, or they can even be oppressed, discriminated, or um, excluded. And, and when, when the society applies a growth based economy, it creates raptures in societies and causing shattering impact on the ecological integrity of our planet. So clearly a growth model of economy, despite it is contributing to measures of peace, for instance, cannot be congruent with the ethic of love we talk about. So how, how would you comment on that? <laughs> so I think that's quite, a, quite, yeah, quite good. Business has a role to play, uh, but there are whole lots of other roles within society as well. And those roles, other roles, part of that's around the governance of business. And so that's really, we can see in many ways, falls down into the domain of government. It's being, it's a, a, we're looking at, let's say, the equitable distribution of resources in many ways, historically, that's come about through a balance of the uh, power, uh, because it's the nature of the uh, yeah, most groups to try and dominate. Uh, and so as soon as you sort of get, a, get a group, which is a collective, and it gets very, very focused on its own interests, it's then about sort of trying to dominate the agendas of society and pretty much disregards others. So look, business operates in a complex, com complex environment, as does everything. We don't live in a world where human beings are perfect, uh, we're all flawed, and whatever we do, uh, in some measures, will be flawed. Now, we can try and a, a reach for the best we can, uh, but even the best of us a, still, in some ways, are flawed. So now, if we come back to business and growth, uh, uh, certainly if we, when the, one of the reasons, so there's a lot of flaws with GDP. I think we need new measures because there's a number of flaws with it doesn't take into account, let's say, a, a capital accounts of society. So I burn down your house, and that's, that's good for GDP, but it doesn't be because you've got to rebuild the house, but it's not good for the capital account of the country and certainly not good for you. So GDP has got a lot of flaws, but one of the things we can see, and politicians focus on it so much, because if GDP drops, that usually signals unemployment or higher levels of unemployment. And with that, governments change. So 
economic, and we can see, we can see in conflict analysis that one of the key things which builds resilience uh, yeah, within a society is the level of wealth. Okay, wealth, wealthy societies just have the ability to spend more money to adapt to shocks. And so we look at the pandemic at the moment, and we look at the uh, the amounts of debt some of the countries are taking on now. The countries which can take on the debt are the ones which are strong. But if we go to Latin America or to Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, as they take on debt, their interest rates skyrocket and up with inflation, and which causes it another one of these systemic negative cycles. And so, I think, I think all this is pretty complex. It's all around balances. Obviously, it's crazy uh, to a, a exhaust the resources of the planet. Uh, that will lead the, uh, to a, a much weakened human race in the long run, a much weakened ecosystem. We do have to really pay attention to these things and work with it. The real issue is not growth of the, the economy. The real issue is that globally we're overpopulated. We need less people on the planet. Uh, I think the second thing is we've really got to start to look at how to look for technological solutions. Uh, obviously, car carbon footprint, climate change is really important. Overfishing of the oceans, incredibly important. We need to be able to maintain uh, the right levels of the uh, forests globally. Uh, it's just a really simple level. They give up oxygen, which we breathe. Do we want to, want to destroy it and end up with half the level of oxygen going into our lungs of what we've got today. Uh, uh, things we put into the environment, microplastics, for example. Uh, uh, but look, we are capable of solving our problems. And we can, climate change, we are actually getting there. I'm, I'm not as pessimistic as most people on climate change. I think we'll actually get there on that one. But we've got many, many other problems as well. Uh, but sort of we've really got to embrace the changes. And a lot of those changes, they're going to come through business. Business are embracing it. I had lunch with one of the uh, yeah, my mates uh, yeah, on Monday. And he does, he's, he, he's an, he does a lot of investments for very, very large uh, private uh, uh, equity group. And look, he, he was just saying, is, look, the energy companies in Australia, they're really starting to get hit because a lot of the fund managers now and the pension funds are making clean, not investing in things which they think are ecologically unsound, like coal. So a lot of these energy companies use coal to generate energy. And so what's happening now is the, the stock prices are getting hit. These things create change. So there's a positive thing coming out of business. If there's a such a thing as loving economy or economy of love, what might it look like? Gee, I've never really, really thought about that. Uh, so I, look, one of the things which we're seeing at the moment is we're seeing a, a, a massive a, a changes in jobs. So talking to sort of the economists, people sort of knowledgeable in these areas, what, particularly with the rise of artificial intelligence, the rise of robotics and other sorts of things, all sorts of jobs are going to get to uh, 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 disappear. So we live in a consumption-based economy. So what's really key, and like our economies aren't going to thrive unless we've, be, we, unless we've got solid consumption. Now, sort of one of the things we can see out of this is as long as you get the right distribution of wealth, we'll have a whole series of new industries rising up because people by nature want to be active. So it's it's not as soon as we get a, a, enough to feel complacent, we stop work. We, we, we're active, got active minds, uh, active bodies. We want to do things. So the lot can come out of that is you can have a whole different set of the uh, services, if you like. And it's, again, it's consumption, but it's not material consumption, it's consumptions of good and services. And that could be meditation courses. Uh, it could be uh, well-being courses. Uh, it could be more uh, therapy, more exercise. Uh, and so you've got this whole range of different industries which we could see crop up, which are around sort of satisfying uh, uh, humans 
but not so much in the material uh, uh, sense, but more in the psychological and physical sense. And from that, you could possibly see those kind of, if, if you could, the rise of these industries, you should pop quite likely to see that as something you could call industries of love. So look, if we look at just, we can see it everywhere. We can see sort of the rise in a lot of these service industries over, the, let's say, the last 20 years, which are around wellness, wholeness, better bodies, and a whole range of different things. And like this is an area which will increase over time, providing we get the right distribution of resources. And that's back to equitable distribution of resources. I think that's leading in the next question you wanted to ask. Yeah, um, it's interesting. You contrast. You 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 provide a contrast between the consumption-based economy and those the other one. I would not imagine because you you early on you talk about peace is vibrant, is pro, love is proactive. But it's almost like the contrast is between consumption, which is kind of a passive and 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 you made to, to things and more proactive such as co-creation you talk about mutual gifting you talk about mutual sharing so there's a lot of those kind of a communal um, um, and a, a communal sense of economy versus market driven competitive uh, uh, competition based economy that's almost like um, I can I can see that has the that kind of economy illustrated has that flavor of, of, of love. Um, now, take work and as an example. We talk about you know, growth-based economy. Work is always somehow in, instrumentalized. We do work in order that we make wealth and so on. But if what would work be like in in the loving economy of an economy of love? We can possibly see work is expression of who we are, of expression of, of love, of love for for the particular kind of a profession or a particular kind of um, a vocation that we want to engage. Work may be a, a form of a service to to each other, and work can also be. Um, a form of relating. That's how we live together. As in, in the community, work may also be uh, a, a form of caring. We care for, for each other, for nature. So you can contrast work or labor in one kind of economy, and that is growth driven and so on. But you could, you could also see the nature of a work in the economy of love. That it, when you see work in that way, work become constituted in our well-being because this is a being well involves working and serving and gifting and caring so that would entirely change the way we are in the world now i said we, we want to come back to the idea of the dichotomy between wealth and well-being so covid pandemic really provided that opportunity for us to see that well-being is actually a global phenomenon. But it well-being also take on your early discussion in terms of health. So well-being is more dynamic. Now, well-being cannot be just our individual experience. Oh, I'm okay, I'm well, and so on. But well-being is a global phenomenon. So if that's the case, how do we understand the global well-being? What might constitute global well-being? And uh, is there a correlation between well-being and peace? Right. Okay. So let, let's come back and sort of let's look at well-being or happiness. You can you can the, the two concepts sort of go together. So the first thing to really do is to understand it. You've got to measure it. Okay. Two ways of measuring well-being or happiness. And the first is through surveys and ask people, are you happy? But the Russians' concept of happiness and the uh, Africans' concept, of, you know, Kenyans' concept of happiness, will be, the answers will be very, very different. But it's one way of doing. The other measure, uh, uh, which is pretty commonly used, is to measure 
social progress indicators. So it's like levels of education, uh, it's per capita income, uh, it's a life expectancy, uh, it's a uh, measures of health. So there's two different ways of doing it uh, uh, now. But does that actually tell us the, what the well-being or happiness really is? I don't think so because it's not actually getting it at our inner state. One is it's a measure of material things which we think make us happy. And the second one is the subjective perspective on it. But in a lot of societies, when you do a survey, people aren't actually going to give you an honest answer. Think of totalitarian states. Uh, you know, would you really tell a surveyor what you really thought? Not going to, not going to do it. So it's it's so actually getting at something gets it gets really really hard. However. Having said that, if we come back and we start to look at peace and this concept positive peace, which we're recovering, recovering earlier on. So we're looking at positive peace. It's also statistically associated with a whole lot of other things we think are important. So we started at peace, but you probably could have started at other points as well and come up with something really quite similar. Because the positive peace are the same conditions which create for a peaceful society can create a whole lot of other things which we think are important, like higher per capita income. So countries which are improving in positive peace compared to countries decreasing in positive peace have 2% per annum, higher GDP growth rate per annum. That's a lot over time. You also, you find measures of well-being and happiness are higher, measures of inclusion, uh, measures of performance and the uh, ecological measures are also much better as well. So therefore, in many ways, positive peace can be described as creating an optimal environment for human potential to flourish. And that sort of comes back to your love. So if you can create an environment where people are more likely to flourish, then they're more likely to be and feel these higher emotions, which we've been talking about. And so I guess that's the angle and the way I start to come at it. Earlier on, you talk about um, whenever you think about the, the proactive way of engaging peace, the leaders of the nations or, or international leaders or global leaders, they can play a significant part. So in, in the Global Peace Index um, um, data, does it provide, do they provide any clue at all in terms of how leaders, especially those high level leaders, we're talking about national leaders, global leaders, should do to actually nurture global well being and global peace? Yes, it's really quite clear from our angle. And that's really, they've got to start to look inside society systemically, look at positive peace, the pillars of positive peace, and then sort of in, work out what are the things you've got to do to improve each of those pillars. So our sort of societies are on, on, on a path, okay? All societies have been in systems thinking path dependent. And so radically changing societies the, quite often can lead to them imploding rather than changing in a positive way. And there's a great, there's Great examples of that through revol many revolutions right through history. So what we suggest is the ways you want to nudge the system in the direction you want to go. So it's many, many small nudges all moving, sort of moving in, in, moving in a particular direction. You need to do this and you need to do it from many different ang angles or lenses. And you can see that sort of viewed through those eight pillars of positive peace. So, and they really do need to engage society as well. And a lot of the time, leadership's about, well, I'm a leader, I've got an idea, let's see, you, we'll go and uh, get you to implement this idea. Uh, but we really do need to engage uh, you know, the people who are going to be affected most by these decisions around what are they looking for, what do they want. And so you've got concepts like deliberative democracy, which are, which are ways where you can actually engage with citizens to be able to get their views on quite often quite complex issues. So we, yeah, so my sense is from the leadership perspective, this is they need to start to look more at this. They need to get a better understanding of systems. 
it's very easy in a political sense to say, okay, there's a problem, here's the cause. And because it's people, things people can really relate to. Uh, a simplistic answer, quite often to a very complex problem. And quite often, uh, those uh, yeah, yeah, simplistic answers are coercive responses as well. Oh, crime's on the increase. Okay, let's get more punitive. Okay, we want to stop people doing that. Let's find them more. Uh, and sort of rather than trying to understand the systemic effects as why it comes about in the first place. Uh, but that's much harder. And changing systems takes time. The Western democracies these days, the, uh, time is not something most politicians have got. They've got an election cycle, <coughs> and then they have to work to that election cycle. So a lot of the time, the, the systems we've got these days is sort of counter, counter to uh, actually having a strong systems pro focus. Yeah, um, so I'm going back to where you started and you talk about the transcendent um, nature of love and that is spirituality. Now, so uh, drawing on the metaphor that um, you offered us, that's Rumi's metaphor of ocean of love. So if the system is that ocean of love, the global systems is that ocean of love. Um, how by applying this kind of spiritual values in, in, in a global system, shift the nature of it? I think, yeah, yes. Yeah. So my, my, view, my view on this is the, uh, 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 it, the systems, okay, and we can view it through a positive piece. The system creates an optimal environment for human potential to flourish. <clears throat> Under those conditions then, People have the ability to make a, have more choices about what they wish to do. So obviously, uh, people who make choices about self-development, it's really important. So in a spiritual sense, in most religions, <clears throat> and certainly very much in the Eastern frame of mind, it's, you can look at the, uh, uh, you can see the spiritual development can be really a reflection the increase in the level of capacity of love which you can have. So at one point, one end, we've got this uh, uh, beautiful concepts of like Rumi's of this universe which is love. And that there is really only one universal value or all part of it, but it's not the reality we're born in. So <clears throat> I'll pose a question, this is around peace, and you could easily apply it to love as well. Uh, everything's relative to something else. But in a spiritual sense, it's just, it seems to be one thing underlying all that. And if we can tap into that, a bitly, just in a very, very minor way, we will actually increase our love and our peacefulness. That's beautiful. Well, in this book, um, Peace in the Age of Chaos, at the beginning, you ask the reader to imagine all the life on the planet as a tapestry, beautifully woven, <laughs> yeah. intricate, exquisite in detail. And you ask the question, what should we all do in relation to that beautiful tapestry? To see ourselves has anything to do with that tapestry, to, to, to think ourselves has anything to do with global peace and the global well-being. Where do we start? For each of us, and it comes down to an individual level, is what do we do to improve the tapestry of life? Now, look, that's just simple. Thing. It can be just really simple things, really simple things. It's like you go into a shop, to buy some goods, smile at the person and say, hey, having a good day? And just little acts, just the simplest acts of kindness do manifest and come back. That's without sort of saying, well, I'm going to take on the world and change it. Uh, uh, but also, just it's the little love is expressed with little acts of kindness. 
That's the best best way I can put it. Best way I can put it. It's really something which happens in the uh, individual level. Well, Steve, that sounds like a perfect note to conclude this conversation on love. And thank you for the gift of sharing. Okay, lovely being here, Shioda. Great chat. Thank you very much. <laughs>